In the summer of 1940, just after the Dunkirk evacuation and with Britain girding for a possible German invasion, the War Office decided to ramp up its intelligence-gathering activities. Quickly and secretly, it opened nine combined services detailed interrogation centres throughout the UK, more simply called cages because they functioned as temporary holding compounds for prisoners of war, the facilities were not uniform in appearance, design or operation. The cage in Doncaster, England, for example, was built on the town's racecourse, while those in Catrick and Loughborough were constructed on bare fields. Not so the London cage. It was housed in three opulent mansions in one of the capital's most exclusive neighbourhoods, numbers 6, 7 and 8 Kensington Palace Gardens. Some of the war's most notorious Nazis were interned in those buildings, separated from adjacent splendid homes by a single strand of barbed wire. The cage network was operated by a shadowy arm of military intelligence known as MI-19, Originally an offshoot of MI5, which was then hunting enemy spies, MI19 soon became completely independent and a vital source of military intelligence thanks to its successful interrogations of German POWs and, as the war progressed, of Nazis either suspected of or charged with war crimes. To run the London cage, where some of the most high-profile German SS officers were sent, the War Office picked a man who seemed perfect for the job. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Scotland was a tough, patriotic Scot and a hardened spy, with extensive experience as a POW interrogator. But Scotland's information extraction methods soon would create discomfort for a government with a reputation for fair play and adherence to the Geneva Conventions. During the nine years that the London cage was in operation, from 1940 to 1948, German prisoners who had been interrogated there complained that they had been subjected to cruel tactics and even torture, information that the British kept secret for decades. Scotland, already in his late fifties when he took command of the London cage, seemed like a character straight out of an Ian Fleming novel. As a young man, fluent in German, he sold provisions to German soldiers in southwest Africa, what is now Namibia. During this period, a British liaison officer pulled Scotland aside, telling him, Learn all you can about the German army, and one day you will be valuable to your country. Scotland, then 22, did that and more, enlisting in the German colonial army in southern Africa between 1904 and 1907. During that stint and later, while still in Africa, he sent information on German manpower, equipment and tactics to British intelligence in Cape Town, South Africa. Thus began Scotland's career as a spy. The Germans imprisoned Scotland for spying in 1914. British soldiers freed him a year later and he was then formally commissioned in the British intelligence service. During World War I, Scotland proved effective at interrogating German prisoners in Europe. He made three perilous trips behind German lines to spy, posing as an African colonist. He again fell under suspicion, but Scotland managed to flee to England, resigned from British intelligence, and was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire, an OBE. He spent the 1920s and early 30s in South America, where he claimed to have a roving job with a well-known company that he left unnamed and made numerous trips to Germany, even meeting Hitler on a visit to Munich. Early in World War II, Scotland was recalled to military duty as a second lieutenant and sent to France with the Intelligence Corps. He later escaped out of Dunkirk after the British defeat, and on his return to Britain, he was promoted and placed in charge of the London cage. Scotland quickly found that Britain had what he called a pathetically inadequate number of officers and men for the tasks of interrogation and intelligence in the field. On the other hand, Scotland himself was surpassingly confident in his abilities to coax statements from Nazi captives interned at the cage. If any German had information we wanted, it was invariably extracted from him in the long run, a 2005 story in the London Guardian, which reviewed many declassified documents in the case shortly after they were first released, quoted Scotland as saying, 
Possibly a more telling was the phrase from Dante's Divine Comedy that Scotland claimed ran through his head every morning that he arrived at work. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. By all accounts, Scotland was successful at his work. Nearly 3,600 men passed through the London cage, which was equipped with five interrogation rooms and staffed by 11 officers, plus a dozen non-commissioned officers who served as interrogators and interpreters. More than a 1,000 gave statements to their British handlers. Just how that information was obtained at the secret prison became a sensitive issue. The cage first aroused suspicions early on in late 1940 when MI9 was aiding MI5's double cross system to convert captured German spies into double agents for the British. Guy Liddell, director of MI5's counterintelligence division, investigated a report that Scotland had punched a captured German agent named Wolf Schmidt, codenamed Tate, during an interrogation. Scotland hit Tate in the jaw, and I think he got one back himself, Little recorded. Most disturbingly, the MI5 man got word that Scotland turned up this morning with a syringe containing some drug or other, which it was thought would induce Schmidt to speak. While the truth of the story is not known, Schmidt subsequently became a double agent for Britain. Because the cages were secret transit centres inhabiting a grey area between the battlefield's clear rules of engagement and the POW camp's international protection, they were opportunities for abuse. And the plethora of intelligence organisations that existed during the war, with their fiefs and tribalism and competitive instincts, may have tacitly led to what some called robust interrogations, and even rogue behaviour at an especially tense time. In fact, another MI-19 interrogation centre at Bad Nendorf in the British zone of Germany, set up after the war, proved to be more problematic for the war office than the London cage. One former inmate described Bad Nendorf, which opened in 1945 to interrogate captured Nazis, as a Cold War torture centre. Lieutenant Colonel Robin Tin I. Stevens, who earlier ran a secret London interrogation centre, codenamed O2O, in the edge of Ham Common, was the bad Nendorf commandant. A physically imposing man, with a monocle and a cigarette holder, Stevens disavowed violent methods. Never strike a man, he said. It is unintelligent, for the spy will give an answer to please, and having given a false answer, all else depends upon the false pretense. That principle may have been broken at Bad Nendorf, which held Germans, Russians, Czechs and Hungarians. Former prisoners there claimed they were tortured, starved and psychologically abused, and two prisoners died of malnutrition. An investigation by the House of Commons led to the camp's closure in July 1947, two years after it was opened. The Foreign Office conducted its own inquiry and discovered that the POW suffered from insufficient clothing, intimidation by the guards, mental and physical torture during the interrogations, and they were kept in solitary confinement for long periods with no exercise. Colonel Stevens was court-martialed, charged with disgraceful conduct of a cruel kind. But he and three others were all cleared of wrongdoing after closed proceedings. British documentation on the affair wasn't released until the mid-2000s. By late 1946, Scotland was attracting a great deal of scrutiny himself. MI5 had conducted two investigations of the London cage during the war years, but nothing came of them. Colin McFadden, the chief interrogator for naval intelligence during the war, knew Scotland and was not fond of his operation. We fought great battles to stop him interrogating our prisoners, McFadden told the BBC. McFadden asserted that Scotland was prepared to interrogate prisoners at the point of a bayonet and added he was a well-known bastard. Scotland certainly had no empathy for the numerous SS and Gestapo officers that were shipped to the London cage, including a few charged with war crimes. Fritz Knöcklein, a German lieutenant colonel in the Waffen-SS, was one such prisoner. 
Knöcklein was brought to the cage in October 1946, accused of ordering the massacre of 124 British soldiers, including 97 members of the Royal Norfolk Regiment, who had surrendered at Le Paradis in northern France in May 1940. At the time, Knöcklein was a company commander in the SS Totenkopf, for Death's Head Division. During his war crimes trial, Knöcklein filed complaints, charging that when he didn't give London cage officials the confession they were seeking, he was stripped and deprived of sleep for four days and nights, and then starved. He also claimed that he was made to stand naked next to a red-hot gas stove for hours, then taken to a bathroom and forced under an ice-cold shower, then scrubbed with coal dust. Knöcklein noted that, following an earlier complaint about his mistreatment, he was punched in the face and then thrown down a flight of stairs. The War Office looked into the accusations but refused to open an inquiry. Both Scotland and the British authorities took the view that Knöcklein's charges were a ploy to save himself from the hangman's noose. As the Director of Army Legal Services, Brigadier Shapcott, put it in 1948, I personally would accept Scotland's word before that of Knöcklein. Scotland had made his views of the Le Paradis case clear in 1945 when he stated, the bringing to justice of those guilty for the brutal crime should become a crusade with every man serving in the army today. Knöcklein was convicted and hanged in January 1949. Several other Germans lodged complaints similar to Knöcklein's. A prisoner named Werner Schaefer alleged that a sergeant major repeatedly beat him with a stick while he was suffering from an attack of malaria and SS Sergeant Eric Zacharias claimed that he had been beaten and worked on psychologically, coerced into a confession. Zacharias was one of 21 former SS and Gestapo men who were accused of murdering 50 Royal Air Force prisoners following a failed escape attempt from Stalag Luft III in 1944, an event later immortalised in print and on film as The Great Escape. At their trial in Hamburg in 1947, the German murder suspects alleged that they had been starved, deprived of sleep, and tortured by an electric shock device inside the London cage. The only evidence against Zacharias and the others were the confessions that they gave to interrogators. The attorney for Zacharias asked that his confession be waived because it was given under duress. Scotland, who was a witness of the trial, later wrote that he was troubled by the fact that these manufactured tales of cruelty towards our German prisoners were fast becoming the chief item of news, while the brutal fate of those 50 RAF officers was in danger of becoming old history. The court did not waive the Zachariah statement, and in the end he and 17 other co-defendants were found guilty. Zacharias and 14 others later were hanged for the Stalag Luft III murders. The International Red Cross monitored POW facilities and detention centres, but it wasn't even aware of the existence of the London cage until its name was inadvertently added to a list of camps that was sent to the organisation in March 1946. A Red Cross inspector called at the London cage twice, but was turned away. After the Red Cross applied more pressure, the British government asked Scotland to open the facility to inspection. Scotland wrote an ominous note to the War Office, quote, The secret gear which we use to check the reliability of information obtained must be removed from the cage before permission is given to inspect the building, unquote. When the Red Cross eventually gained entry, most of the worst injured and malnourished prisoners had been spirited away to a hospital the night before, and the inspector found nothing amiss. In Scotland's memoir, written in the early 1950s, he acknowledged using tough tactics. He wrote that, Prisoners had been forced to kneel while being beaten about the head, forced to stand to attention for up to 26 hours, threatened with execution, or threatened with an unnecessary operation. But when he submitted the memoir to the War Office for censorship, the government threatened him with prosecution under the Official Secrets Act of 1911. 
In 1955, special branch detectives raided Scotland's retirement flat and seized copies of his manuscript along with research material and old files from the cage that he had secretly kept. An MI5 document at Britain's National Archives discloses that Scotland's manuscript was taken, among other reasons, because, quote, it reveals some infringements of the Geneva Convention, end of quote. In 1957, a heavily censored version of his book, titled The London Cage, was finally permitted in Britain. In it, Scotland denies that violence was used to extract confessions, though he did admit that things were done that were mentally just as cruel. For example, one cheeky and obstinate prisoner was forced to strip naked and exercise. This deflated him completely, wrote Scotland, and he began to talk. Prisoners were sometimes forced to stand round the clock, and if a prisoner wanted to pee, he had to do it there and then, in his clothes. It was surprisingly effective. Certainly there is no record of prisoner mistreatment being sanctioned at high levels, though it seems likely that elements within British intelligence turned a blind eye to aggressive or worse behaviour. The government did not want any accusations or investigative findings related to prisoner mistreatment to be made public. They could have compromised the war crimes trials, damaged Britain's international standing and antagonised the Soviet Union. Although the United States awarded Scotland the Bronze Star in 1946 for his POW interrogation work and for enhancing US-UK cooperation, he received nothing from his own government. Whether these suspected breaches had anything to do with that is not known. Assessing the mistreatment allegations of the London cage, MI5 officer Guy Little wrote in his memoir, Apart from the moral aspect of the thing, I am convinced that these Gestapo methods do not pay in the long run. Scotland, who died in 1965, aged 82, claims to have agreed. In his memoir, he writes that people were intrigued by his success at getting Nazi criminals to confess their roles in the Stalag Luft III murders. There was no mystery as to how it was accomplished, he wrote. He merely asked each German suspect to write a detailed version of his involvement in the crime. Then the various versions were cross-checked, discrepancies noted, lies detected. In that way, he noted, enough of the truth could be ferreted out to establish a case for the court. We were not so foolish as to imagine, he wrote, that petty violence, nor even violence of a stronger character, was likely to produce the results we hoped for in dealing with some of the toughest creatures of the Hitler regime. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share, and visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. 